Uh, let's get to start. So today I'm going to cover the gap uh, which I couldn't cover last week. So let's do a quick jump. So what is GAN? Yeah, GAN is a boundary generative network, a uh, generative model for the amplified device line stuff. So the concept of, of GAN is uh, basically there are two network lines the generator network to generate the data point, even the random noise at three. And uh, also at play another network, so called the discriminator network. Uh, basically, this network is to uh, this is a just a binary crash fire to uh, to see if the image is uh, generated by the gener uh, generator network or real real data set, even from training data set. So by training this two network, uh, generate uh, hopefully, yeah, finally get uh, train up, train so that uh, generate network produce a real looking uh, data point. This is the point, and uh, the way how to train network is the there's a one objective function, so called uh, minimax uh, function. It's basically uh, from the uh, discriminator perspective, discriminator try to maximize this objective function so that this uh, discriminator can identify, okay, this is a uh, uh, fake data generated by a uh, GAN, or okay, this is a real actual data given from a uh, true data set. And then from, uh, on the other hand, uh, from generator perspective, generator try to minimize this objective function. Uh, uh, oh, and the ideally, uh, the generated uh, uh, data point generated by generator network uh, should, should uh, see the discriminate data network to out of the score close to zero. Yeah, this is a uh, uh, yeah, basic concept of GAN. So, okay, so let's start from here, so back to GAN. So uh, in this slide, the original lecture was uh, asking some question regarding the uh, uh, discriminator perspective. So basically this is a minimax, minimax object function. But uh, is it feasible to just train a discriminator network first and then make discriminator very, very smart? And is it to work? And the answer is no. And the reason will be explained uh, uh, the next slide. Okay, so the reason why, uh, okay, so basically in Yang, uh, we have to train generator network and the discriminator network alternatively uh, instead of training a one network uh, intensively because the if uh, okay let's say uh, if uh, possibly we train a discriminator network very intensely then uh, okay we get a very, very smart discriminator uh, which can identify if this is a, a fake image or real image then what, hap what happens if the we uh, we lost the gradient of two train a generator network. Uh, this is problem with the so-called discriminator saturation problem. So the reason why it's happening is that the okay, so basically uh, discriminator discriminator network B is a neural network, and this is a binary classifier. And uh, okay, let's say we use a sigmoid function for activation function B. Uh, discriminator network. Then what happening is that if discriminator network is, is very smart, then discriminator will out of the uh, like extreme value. So basically, the sigmoid function is like uh, value ranging from like uh, close to zero to one. So this is a zero to one. Uh, this is a value range of uh, sigmoid function. And uh, if discriminator is very confident, okay, this is a real image, then discriminator will out of the value close, close to one. And uh, on the other hand, if discriminator is very high confident that, okay, this is a fake image, then discriminator network final out of the score should be cro very close to zero. So, 
in that case, okay, so this is a sigmoidal function, and that this is a derivative of the sigmoidal function. So as you can see, in sigmoidal function, uh, if uh, value is like close to zero or one, then uh, derivative is uh, very, very small by, so which means we cannot get enough gradient to train network. So this is the reason why we have to train alternatively in three network. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, objective function. So from this meta perspective, so we maximize the objective function, but uh, in this slight notation, uh, just multiply minus one so that this problem can be formulated as the minimization problem, but I think this is the uh, same. Uh, from this meta uh, perspective, uh, we'd like to uh, minimize uh, this objective function. To do so, uh, as we usually do in deep learning training, we do a gradient of descent to updating a, a, neural, net, a neural network parameter theta b. And the, on the other hand, from generator network perspective, generator would like to minimize this objective function, and the same uh, same uh, the same way as this meta network to uh, this data network also updating a parameter by gradient descent factors. Uh, but the thing is that uh, this uh, training is a, a kind of zero sum game. So uh, this is a uh, make it uh, training difficult. So and a good a good fair a good tutorial suggests we modify the objective function to make it the non non zero sum game. So, okay, let's say, right? So, idea is very simple. So, good uh, friend suggests that uh, make up a big change for objective function. So, this is a reasonable one uh, suggested by good fellow, but uh, okay, so this is a estimator minimization problem, and uh, this is a generator minimization problem. But uh, we can convert the problem into this. So it, basically, this meta objective function is the same. But we change uh, we can we may change our objective function from uh, above one to the below one. Uh, that change uh, that change is very simple. Like right? originally, this is a minimization problem. Minimizing the uh, log one minus log dz, but actually, uh, essentially, this is uh, equivalent to maximizing the uh, log d of g of z because this is a uh, like one is a constant and uh, this is a uh, minus one, so uh, it, which means maximizing uh, this objective function is equivalent equivalent to maximizing the uh, uh, this function, which is the expectation of the log d of g of z. So this is a way to, yeah, make a training more stable. Okay, so this slide is uh, taken from the Stanford lecture. Uh, uh, very good to understand. So this is a uh, algorithm to in your GAN network. So basically we define like a uh, number of epoch, how many times we generate the training, and uh, we this is the epoch. And uh, we have a inner loop for the uh, k steps. So k step uh, means uh, how many times we update the parameter of the disk meta network before updating the generator network. So we can uh, set any value actually, but uh, actually good fellow and uh, this also this stuff of the lecture suggests to use uh, k equal one. Uh, but that's it. 
I, I think there's no theoretical reason, but uh, maybe uh, that's a little bit of but uh, so something like K, uh, using a K equal one. Then what happens if we set a K equal one, we train a, we upgrade the parameter of this discriminator network, then we fix the uh, discriminator network and uh, upgrade a generator network, then uh, go, go back to the uh, discriminator network frame and keep iterating. So it is how many times you are updating your discriminator without touching the generator. Yes, exactly. So, so when you have k equals one, then you yeah. just do each yeah. all of these times. Yes. Okay. Yes. So basically, the thing is that uh, this, uh, yeah, when we try the discriminator network, then we fix uh, generator network. And on the other hand, if when we train uh, generator network, then we fix uh, discriminator network. Is there ever a case where you would want to do more steps on the on the generator rather than the discriminator? Uh, your question is the, uh, are you discussing about the case where we increase the number of k? No, uh, the, the reverse. So suggesting oh, okay. that you, you add another for loop or L steps to the generator up oh, okay, okay. And, and you said L to a larger number. Would that not work? Or why, why is it always the case that the mm -hmm. generator only counts once? Oh, okay. So. Uh, Okay, this discussion is uh, can we set like a change the iteration such that the, we train a generator network multiple times before touching a discriminator network? Okay, yeah, actually, it's an interesting point. But the, as far as I read a uh, couple of young paper, I have never seen such a way to train. But uh, yeah, I think this idea yeah, is like a very natural to think about it. Maybe it's study like so. So, um, so, yeah, so currently it can be done on the, um, I, like I can understand why you'd want to just alternate entirely, but you want both to get better. But perhaps during different times of the training, it's better to improve one versus the other. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like if, if you're discriminated, it's really terrible. Maybe it's good to train it a couple of times. Uh, yeah. And if the generator is really not not doing a good job of making yeah. anything, then the discriminator can, can be confused on a couple of maybe it's good to do it a couple of times. Yeah. So I did some like a discussion, like a that is kind of like adversarial uh, network, but uh, Actually, the essence is uh, like generator network and the discriminator network are kind of like cooperating to make, make like a, make it better each other. So, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, as you said, the uh, just on the point. So, on the first discriminator, there seems to be a genuine issue of uh, whatever gradient saturation problem. Yeah. So that, that's why we don't want to do say more uh, more number of loops on the AK. There is no literature which says there is an issue between the generator and the right. Meaning there is nothing, no constraint on why we cannot do more. Uh, uh, more uh, rounds. Meaning the second motivation for oh, okay. very extra steps. The, the, I mean, at least there is, uh, there at least we know that there is some constraint that we don't know. But right. here, that's not it. Uh, so, yeah. I so, so if I was asking why uh, we, we, we do not update the generator k times, no, no, it's all times. times. Yeah, I'm just why, saying that why, why, why don't you say you can update the, 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 yeah, the, 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 so, uh, so uh, when the uh, so that's why the discriminator must be updated for multiple times because we want to we 
200 generator to uh, sorry 200 discriminator to get to the optimal uh, discriminator so that it can accurately measure the JS divergence. Uh, but when the generate uh, when the discriminator is fixed, uh, we update the generator to minimize the JS divergence. Uh, but uh, this this kind of update cannot do multiple times because when we do one step of update, the actually the uh, the JS divergence will change. So we must uh, retrain the discriminator again to get the, the correct to get the correct JS divergence. So that's the one uh, explanation that I saw in some uh, other work. Yeah. Is it is it always some discriminator first thing or by the generator? I mean, I'm asking about the order of training. Right. Um, my opinion is that the not necessarily, but the, the thing is that if like a discriminator is like initialized completely by random, then discriminator is just not to randomness, which is like a yeah, very, which is useless for very first yeah. Maybe yeah. yeah. this meta shouldn't be too smart at the first time, but uh, also this meta should be like too like a good to to have. Uh, maybe this meta should be yeah like a yeah shouldn't be too extreme like very should not be too smart or too. Good. So uh, this is our uh, image samples generated by Jan on the experiment on the 2014. And uh, okay, so we can see, okay, so there's a couple of images. And uh, my understanding is of the image on the right hand side. And uh, circled by the hero box. Uh, actually, uh, this is a real, real data set. Real data. Which you use for training and uh, this guy. And uh, this guy uh, images are generated by the And uh, the reason why we put the real image data here is that the yeah, just comparing a uh, training data set and uh, generated uh, data set to see if Gan is just like a copying guy existing the data set or not. Yeah, if, if you can just copy that the uh, training data set, uh, which is useless. But uh, so, uh, for example, this like uh, like uh, digital data. So yes, uh, this one is a very close to the training data set. But other digits are generated uh, are defined from the uh, captured training data set, which is here. But uh, Still, um, but we have an issue when we use a GAN. Uh, one of the issues highlighted here is a model class. Let's say uh, original data, uh, this data is, uh, consists of the like, uh, eight Gaussian mixture. And uh, so, okay, let's say uh, we would like to train a GAN network in order to generate a two data distribution. But uh, what we get is uh, this kind of uh, data distribution, like uh, even though we iterating a training step, what we see is uh, one mode of distribution, which is apart from the uh, ideal distribution, what we want to get. Because we cannot capture eight mode of uh, mixture of Gaussian. Okay, then why it happened is that uh, so my ex uh, ex explanation is the so basically yeah when we train a GAN we have no way uh, we don't uh, penalize the to generating a uh, image I mean uh, 
uh, let's say like uh, we we are going to train a PR network which out of the digit from zero to uh, to nine. But if we train a PR to generate this kind of data, uh, generate a network might have a motivation to like a see that this meta networks, but the uh, Generator network doesn't have a motivation to generate a diverse image, which means if gen generator keeps generating an image which is bit like a close to nine, then this meta may be generate a very good uh, like uh, image like uh, digit nine. Then finally, generator uh, successfully like cheat the this meta network. So there's no uh, like incentive to generating a diverse image. Uh, this is about the uh, possible explanation of why we observe a model graph. Because uh, if this meta uh, generator uh, can generate a data point close to here, then uh, it's more likely to create a high quality image which can see the schema data. But uh, there is no motivation to generate a diverse image because it might uh, increase the risk to like this uh, disk uh, meta detects, okay, this is a fake uh, image by the so, Okay, so right now, uh, so there are a couple of research to uh, deal with this kind of uh, monocrops problem, but uh, this time uh, we are going to uh, Discuss about the how to evaluate that like, plan uh, out of it. But basically, this is very difficult to understand open problem. The reason is that uh, compared to other models that we discussed, such as the auto regressive model or uh, variational auto encoder, uh, uh, basically they have explicit density function. So, in, in that case, we can compute a likelihood score to compare across the models, but uh, in Gyan, we give up to estimating an uh, explicit density function, so we cannot do the same way. We need to, we need to think about how to do that. So a uh, couple of ways couple of way I uh, propose to evaluate that Gyan. First one is a pattern window density estimator. So OK, let me explain how it works. So, there's a formula, but I, I will draw a picture to explain more intuitively. Do you want a separate slide for that? Uh, or you want this right there? Yeah, I, I, I can write here. OK, so the idea of uh, pattern window density estimator is the, OK, let's say we take a sample from the network. Then let's say, then, uh, then we can draw a histogram. Okay, let's say this is a, a histogram there. Okay, so sample from GAN is distributed like this. Okay, so this is a histogram. Okay, so which means, yeah, like how many times we get to a sample between this two. This is the so-called band of this H. But uh, yeah, this is a just a observation, so we don't have an explicit mathematical formula. But we can still uh, approximate a function X by using this formula. So intuitively, uh, the way kernel density estimates are doing with the, uh, we use a uh, this, uh, kernel function. In this case, we may take a standard normal distribution as a kernel function. <laughs> then what we do is, okay, we have, okay, this point, we have a, this, this program value and the, at this point, we have 
we have a uh, prior kernel function. This is a, a Gaussian, which is denoted here. So once we have a histogram, we can compute our value by just summing up each Gaussian value. So this is a P hat, PH hat rate. So then finally, we can get the uh, explicit density function, even though this is not perfect, but at least we have a function explicit on which might approximate the uh, actual distribution. But here, uh, we need to think of the bandwidth stage, uh, which is a hyperparameter. Actually, it depends on the how much videos we take for each beam. So, if we take a very like, wide videos in each beam, then we, we might get a more smooth distribution. But also, it increases the risk that we miss some like a minor, minor spike in the actual distribution. So it's a kind of problem. Uh, this chart is an example of how we get a different uh, estimated value in the pattern window uh, density estimator. So this is the actual distribution. Uh, this is a beautiful gray color. And uh, each line, get line, we set the hyperparameter H as a zero portion of like a distribution because we take a more smaller uh, bandwidth. And on the other hand, uh, if we see a um, blue line, we take more broader bandwidth. In that case, we get a more smooth uh, function. So when we estimate a uh, function form by using pattern window estimator, uh, we need to uh, like tune this type of parameter by using a by uh, using a like validation data set to see if it works well. So this is a evaluation score by using a pattern window estimator and computing a uh, uh, computing a likelihood score. So yeah, this actually it actually depends on the which data set we use. Uh, in this, uh, we get the uh, result score by using a plan. But uh, uh, a TFT from base data set, uh, yeah, can also get that. But uh, um, sometimes we need again to uh, loss against the other one or something like this. Uh, however, uh, this is uh, not a perfect way to but and, uh, as, and uh, in this recent research, uh, I, I have the no researcher used uh, this way to evaluate that uh, This is a reason why. Uh, this chart is explaining why uh, researchers are no longer using this way to evaluate the candidate. So, in left, uh, left hand side, uh, this is a log likelihood uh, score. And uh, okay, suppose uh, we already know uh, actual data distribution, and uh, this is a log likelihood of the actual data distribution. And, uh, this is a log likelihood of the estimated uh, density function. So even though we increase a sample to get a better density estimation, but we still have a very like, long way to go to, the, to make it a closer to uh, actual data distribution. And it seems to be already converged to a certain value. So, this is a so called uh, underestimate problem. And on the other hand, uh, in right hand side, uh, we also face uh, overestimate issue. 
So let's say we already know a few distributions, uh, like we could score, but actually, uh, the result of some experiments shows a more higher like we could score than the it will get a distribution, which means the uh, this approach might have a risk to overestimating a uh, result, so which is not good. Okay, we're gonna wait for a minute here. Uh, I think those on remote have helped seeing the screen. So uh, we'll try to put those of you on remote, can you can you uh, see the screen? Uh, it's still stuck for me. Is it working or not? Um it's stuck on one page, so it's not reflecting what's shown on the screen. Okay. Let's try it again. see the screen? Uh, it's black. Uh, I can see your cursor, but it's like, it's just a black screen. Okay, good. Um, yeah, maybe after this segment, we'll have to switch computers. Maybe Sure, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. are you able to see the screen now or is it still lagging? Uh, it's not like it's just a black screen now. Like after you restarted the screen sharing, okay. it's black. Yeah. Can you see our uh, our display now? I can. Yeah, we can I, see your desktop. Yeah, your I can see your desktop. Yeah. This unfortunately is not the right screen, so uh, we're gonna have to go back and see the. Uh, it's the black screen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's still black. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm going to discuss about the inceptions for I'm going to talk about the exception score. So as we uh, found earlier, like uh, alpha middle SPS may die down of the particular way to ever that can. So is there any other way to do that? So yeah, say. 
especially for image uh, image processing problem, uh, we may use the instruction score. The concept is that uh, we use a pre-trained inception network, so-called inception network. Uh, this is a pre-trained classifier uh, by using a uh, ImageNet dataset. So ImageNet dataset has uh, 1,000 plus. Uh, this is a multi-level uh, classifier. So we use this uh, pre-trained classifier to see how uh, to see if uh, it can uh, put a lot. So Okay, so before uh, jumping to the uh, mathematical formula, uh, we need, okay, let me explain the two principles, uh, how, why and how special score is uh, good. So first principle, so, so what is a better uh, image generation by GAN? So one thing is, uh, okay, GAN should generate a real looking image. This, uh, this should be a very important criteria. And also, the uh, second metric to, uh, to be considered should be uh, uh, generated data should be very diverse. Because if we keep, uh, if can keep generating uh, like similar real looking but a very similar image, it's not kind of useless, right? So, to achieve so, um, we, we can formulate a problem like this. So, let me explain by this visualization. So, okay, so my axis is a probability. So, and the x axis is a little bit plus. This is a one to one thousand plus in image network set. And Okay, so ideally, so ideally, generated image should be should have at least two proper uh, principles. Should hold these two pro, uh, principles that I explained earlier. So one principal should be So first of all, the image generated by GAN should be very real looking image. Um, we can rephrase uh, this like this. So which means let's say we generate an image. Let's say we generate a, like a cat image by using GAN. And uh, let's say that like, ImageNet has a class so called uh, cat. Actually, I don't know which class is this in one single image net class, but I this is uh, assumption. And uh, the good, uh, good image, if, uh, okay, we use, use a inception network to get the likely, like a kind of probability score across all images. Let's say I input uh, generated uh, the image, generated by the to the inception network. Then what we get is uh, we get the uh, kind of softmax score in each cl uh, class, like uh, for class one, probability score is very less than 0.00, something like this one. And uh, regarding class two, we get the more uh, high confidence score, so let's say 0 0.71 or something. In this case, uh, the, uh, uh, Image generated by GAN should be good. Yeah, because uh, classifier can easily ident like, uh, identify that this is a, a cat image. So, which means uh, this uh, image generated by GAN is a kind of real looking image. So, let's think about the uh, opposite case. If we get to a, a, a softmax score, like something like a, even the distributed, regardless of class one, two, three, four, which means uh, inception score is very, uh, less confident to, to assert okay, this is a cat image or a dog image or image of a cat or a bird. So, which is good, not good, because 
can fail to generate the real thing again. So this is the first huge problem. So basically, this prediction score is equivalent to uh, P of Y given X. So X is the image, and the Y is the label. And the softmax uh, give a pitch approximately for image plus seven. So which means, uh, ideally, uh, this P of Y given Z should output this kind of uh, uh, extreme value. Actually, this is equivalent to the have a uh, uh, low entropy. Yeah, so this is the first principle. And uh, OK, okay also, let me explain about the second principle. So second principle is, I guess uh, we have to generate a more diverse image. So which means PY should have a high entropy, which is equivalent to Generating a, like a PY should be distributed uh, kind of evenly instead of having very like a extreme value like this. In that case, uh, uh, this is a good, yeah, can manage to generate a diverse image. So we do, okay, so this is a, a tool, a big idea uh, behind the inception score. Okay, then how do we formulate this into the mathematical score? So here we are using a uh, KL divergence. The reason why we use KL divergence is that KL divergence is a kind of uh, like a distance, uh, mathematically not uh, precisely distance, but it's a kind of metric to see if distribution is very close or uh, very far away. So let's think of the uh, ideal data distribution to P of Y given X. It should distribute it like this, right? Y, y uh, X axis is a kind of level. And uh, this is Y axis is a probability. So ideally, P of Y given X should distribute like this. And on the other hand, uh, in second principle, P Y should distribute like this. So, which means if we compute the KL divergence between two distribution, and uh, if if KL divergence divergence is very big, which means uh, we get the better yeah we get a better result, right? Because uh, it's equivalent. Uh, if KL divergence is a very small, which means these two distributions form a very similar, but if k divergence is very big, which means these two distribution shape is uh, completely different. Yeah, this is the reason why we are using a k divergence here. And also, actually, mathematically, this is equivalent to the, uh, this is the entropy. Uh, entropy h minus the entropy of y given x. So as I explained earlier, so high, so, in the second principle, a diverse image is better, which means high entropy is uh, desirable. And on the other hand, uh, second form, this should be a, a, a ideal form is a more low entropy. So which means the first term is getting higher and the second term is getting lower, we get a higher inception score. So uh, in conclusion, so inception score is a basic Basically, this is a metric, uh, higher is better and the lower is uh, not good. So this is a, yeah, the result comparison uh, by using a inception score. And the, I'm also uh, explain about the question inception distance, uh, so-called FYD. Okay, just uh, uh, a note on time, it's the one hour in. Uh, Around 15 slides, 15 and, and stuff. 
have any suggestion on what you'd like to do? Either we can stay extra, extra, extra long, or we can um, try to um, postpone some session. Do you guys have any? We're conducting it on the weekend, be okay. okay. On the weekend? We can do that if there's enough uh, interest to do it over the weekend. Anyways, it's being recorded. Yeah, we're the presentation, so it's fine. But, uh, want to do it on the weekend we could but I don't know whether anyone is willing to do that okay I, I don't think there's a, a lot of consensus for that okay um okay then then what I think we do is we finish up week six first because uh I think uh Taka and uh some other folks are from week six who here is presenting in week six because last week we didn't finish right so uh, are you week six? Yeah. Okay, so you're presenting, supposed to present last week. Yeah. Okay. So uh, maybe we'll finish uh, yours and Taka's today. Yeah. Okay. And then the week seven will become week eight. Week eight will become week nine, et cetera. And then week seven and week 13, I guess they haven't started yet. So we'll just reallocate as, as appropriate. Okay. Would that be all right for everyone? Yeah, because yeah, otherwise uh, we're going to have a problem that every week we're going to have to deal with that. Okay. All right. So thanks for that. Sorry that uh, we're running a little late. I think you know, they also didn't quite plan their syllabus properly because there's some overlaps in many of these. Okay. Have they too much material actually? There's quite a lot. Uh, even with some which are presenting at fast, quite a fast. Yeah, so uh, we'll try to do a more thorough job with all of you being uh, just attending to one part, but it still needs to be we need a sufficient time to do it. Okay. All right. So we'll we'll go ahead. So uh, we set the recess people will present next week for week seven, and we'll let the people know in week seven that they're presenting in week eight. So. All right. Thank you. Go ahead, Taka. So you have a. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, almost finished. Like, almost finished. Okay, so you have another ten uh, minutes or so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you have this section of this one. Yes. So uh, this is the last topic uh, I'm going to uh, explain. So uh, this is a, a fresh inception distance inquiry. Uh, it's a different metrics of the inception score. We got uh, inception score is basically using uh, image method first. Uh, but uh, in actual use case, it's not of uh, image class uh, corresponding to uh, reception, uh, like a uh, reception network. So if I this approach is uh, defined, uh, if I did, uh, try to capture some like animals using a deep learning architecture. So uh, the concept behind the FID is uh, using a kind of uh, uh, embedded, embedded feature to and then compare between the actual data set and the uh, data set generated by the client. So here we also use a pre-trained inception network. So as you know, uh, this is a new network. Basically, this is an inception network. So this is a... And So this is an input of neural network. So we input a pixel, uh, maybe pixel image. Then uh, we compute the value in each uh, 
into AI and uh, just, just providing the uh, accumulate uh, result to the data data layer. And we use a specific layer, so called uh, inception VCB network to three layer, which is this one. So the way we consider it like is okay, we input uh, two types of uh, input. So firstly, we input the uh, uh, actual real data set. And uh, we compute, uh, we just uh, pro uh, propagate the deep, uh, deep learning. Then we get some like a, then uh, extract the feature value, which is uh, different from original pixel input, but uh, we get some of the embedded, embedded value in the feature. So, then once we get uh, this embedded feature, we compute uh, kind of uh, moment of scope statistics. Like we just compute uh, mean and uh, also uh, covariance model for uh, real, real mean. And also, uh, we we input the uh, image then it provides here, yeah. and also we do the same like for uh, for the propagation computing, and we get the uh, uh, corresponding feature set of the young image, and we also compute the mean, uh, mean value and the uh, covariance matrix. Then uh, what we do is we compute our uh, kind of distance for between, let's say this is a real and that this is a generated by Jan. So once we get the distance where we compute the difference of the mean value of the embedded feature, and also we compute the different kind of difference between covariant. The idea behind why we do this is, uh, we, uh, there is an assumption that uh, okay, so firstly, this embedded feature distributed uh, and following the Gaussian. And also, we uh, another important assumption should be embedded feature should be very similar between a real image and the uh, image generated by the uh, This image should have a similar like, embedded feature. This is assumption. So, which means this distance is very uh, this. Uh, this distance is very small, which means uh, image is uh, very, uh, very similar. So, yes, this is a function. So, does this, uh, you know, you're, you're projecting the generated image into a feature space and then comparing yeah. on the feature space, right? Yeah. Does this address this problem of having copied the actual images? Doesn't that mean that uh, if you had a uh, a list of 1,000 images, you would still get a perfect uh, inception score uh, of this type? Uh, I don't think so. If, like, uh, Jan just uh, copy a uh, training data set, maybe this FYD gives a better score because there's no way to penalize uh, like uh, just copying uh, the idea of data. So they're looking at the mean and covariance, so they're just capturing some correlation with the features on the yeah, the pooling layer. So they're just trying to remove it from the actual physical image. So yeah, actually, yeah, this is also uh, might, might be not a uh, perfect way, but because uh, putting an assumption, uh, we need a assum uh, assumption. One is the embedded feature is following the Gaussian, and uh, 
the MD50 feature, uh, this is the one assumption, the second assumption, the MD50 feature very close uh, between the, each other. If uh, Jan generates a uh, real looking MD50. What is exception? Yeah. There is a pool, there is a network. Or ah, yes, uh, this inception network is uh, yeah, just one neural network. Yeah, just, just a type of neural network, uh, which is already pre trained. Already pre trained? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just using a pre trained network to compute a MBD feature. Is this the one where like this retrain it requires pretty good features already developed? What is this one? Uh, so your question is the corner one. That's fine. I was wondering whether because this is because you mentioned you mentioned that this inception will be equal to another network on top of that. It's already got all the features. So this is one where it's important that it has very well defined features, good features, otherwise the FID will fail. Uh, yeah. yeah, so the assumption here is that uh, exception network can capture like better feature in like a good series layer. Yeah. yeah, otherwise, yeah, it fails. Yeah, we will get that information. So, I mean, inception is uh, the retrain model is trained on MIDI N1000, right? Or I forget that data. So, you're trying to classify natural images in image N2. I guess the idea behind the original inception approach was to decide whether it looks like any of those 1,000 images. But then, uh, from what I remember, the lecture was saying here is that if you wanted to uh, generate things that are not inside of image N1000, then uh, you wouldn't be able to yeah. uh, look at image N1000. So what they're saying is you tear off top levels like you do for a lot of transfers. And you just go to the, the close to the final layer of uh, features, which are supposed to be already symmetrically uh, significant. And then you just calculate the distance of those features. So uh, again, it's, it's the idea that you know, you're comparing semantic features of some sort uh, close to the top of the So I have been discussing about the metric slides to take ID and that this is a inception score, but I suppose this is a kind of reverse of inception score. So as we see earlier, so in FID score, uh, lower score is better because we compute the distance between two uh, input set. So what we see is, okay, so this is a better image, but if we add a noise here, then we get a higher FID score. So which means FID score can capture this kind of like sandman, which is good. And also capturing a blue, blue noise to make the image more like a big, then FID score is great. So which means, okay, this metrics capture this kind of the image quality. So this is good. Uh, on the other hand, inception, uh, this is a, in part of the inception score, I suppose, and that, but uh, what we found is even though we increase the noise level, so noise level is uh, getting the admin go to the right side. But uh, we don't see significant difference in the score, so which is not good. And even if we make an image more big, but the uh, Score is kind of uh, fluctuates, so which is not good. So if I did manage to capture this kind of uh, image quality, so and uh, this is another example. So we have another type of noise, and uh, so if I did score can capture this kind of noise compared to the inception score here. And uh, another example is the 
So basically, you, yeah, don't try to generate the human space, but uh, so we have a node which is uh, generating the, I suppose this is a clock, and uh, this is a car, which is not, not good because this can support to generate a human space. In this case, also increasing the FID score 52. So uh, compared to inception score, FID score is uh, better. Uh, this is a, uh, yeah, given by the, I suppose the uh, inventor of the FID score. So yeah, let me wrap up the, my discussion. So, so, so yeah, uh, QPC is the, okay, we can do a fast sampling and no one in finds. And then we don't estimate the XP, the XP function with the sample, but we can get the fast and the, uh, about, uh, hopefully, uh, better sample. But uh, the kind of service to like, uh, building uh, in files by doing some reverse engineering, yeah, but the uh, lecture I was saying to nobody has not done this kind of work yet. Yeah. Uh, that's all from my part. What I talk is about two papers. The first paper is called DC GAN. It's deep convolution, uh, convolutional DC uh, GAN. This paper is published in, in two, uh, 2015. So it's four years ago's paper. It's a, it's a little old. So I will go through it quick. The what he uh, what uh, this the main contribution that he published uh, way from this this is the latent value z and uh, this dimension is the one hundred so he in it this one hundred dimension z latent z and uh, then do up sample. Oh, no, 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 the, it's, uh, called the, it's called the deconvolution. He do the deconvolution then to from the latent uh, Z dimension is 100, then transfer it into the dimension of four plus four plus one solid. And then he uh, expand it uh, one by one. After five layers, one, two, three, four, five, five layers, and he finally gets the convolution, uh, finally gets a result, which is a picture, has three channels. You can call it, so this dimension is 64 plus uh, multiple four multiple three. And uh, this two is the pixel size, three is the channel. So what is the main, uh, main contribution is that he, uh, he find a way from the latent Z to the real data. So let's introduce this one by one. Uh, first, this architecture works well. Okay, that's enough. Second, it gets rid of uh, max polling and uh, the um, convolutional network. Yeah, because this work is used uh, the deconvolutional. Mm. 
let's introduce some example of deconvolution. Deconvolution is that uh, if we want to transfer from, if we have a date, which is uh, two mountain two, and then we want to transfer it into five mountain five, and how can we, and uh, how can we do it? Uh, Let's me introduce one solution is that uh, to split yeah to split this one into uh, five plus five uh, four, four plus four. four plus four you know four okay fine then we have a date is a Then we can uh, we can use uh, we can use uh, a kernel, which can be two multi two kernel. The result is actually some simple 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 faster. And we can use this kernel from this, from here, and to here, and to here. Then we can get a three dimension. And after this three, and uh, after this by x and uh, y, we can finally get a three multi three three dots. Uh, can you understand? This is a uh, is uh, yeah. How do you fill the outer one? Then make it from the two by two. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, this is a way called the deconvolution. Is one of the way of deconvolution, which can make the data from the two plus uh, two multi two into three multi three. So if I you back it or you use a to get more of the integer there. Zeros, what do you do? Oh, yeah, it's a plus zero. They're all zeros. Yeah, all, zero, all of them is zero. And since I have a choice, can I put A, A, and B? Yeah, yes, and this, uh, this kernel. And I can choose some sort of pattern I want. Oh, that is so. Four B's, four C's, four B's. Yeah, there are many ways. I, I, I only introduce one of these. Actually, it's an example of the decomposition. Uh, yeah, I know. I just uh, introduced how to how to transfer from the two uh, two multi two into three multi three, and this is the uh, one solution. And there are other uh, there are so many other solutions in the internet that uh, use uh, deconvolution. So I guess the question is: Is there a common way that people usually oh, deal with the padding on the outside? Oh, it's is it uh, standard to use. Uh, zero? It's a way, but uh, maybe not not the standard art. It's just a way. So this is the deconvolution, and uh, oh, it's introduced. Then um, uh, it's, it's, it's also called uh, upsampling from the two multi two to three multi three. Then I introduce. Uh, and then he also used the uh, batch normalization. Batch normalization is uh, uh, help the prevent the mode collapse. Match normalization is that one one uh, one a layer is a date in one layer is uh, the distribution of the date is is on is unbalanced. So then he can use special normalization to balance this date distribution into into normal. What uh, and uh, he the the other things such as R E L U and the link R E L U. This is the 
This is R E L U, and uh, what should he use? The R E L U. Why he uses the leak R E L U is that he wants to uh, maintain this uh, maintain the value when the when the value is less than zero. He wants to uh, maintain this uh, gradient in the discriminator, and uh, the R E L U is using generator. But uh, for the reason he didn't show. He, the, he only said that in the discriminators, he needs to maintain the, the, the gradient when the value is less than zero. And uh, the, uh, there is an optimization, uh, optimizer, optimizer. This is uh, the last sentence is about uh, some parameters about the leak uh, value. Then we can see the, the DC gains result. If you see this clearly, then you can find that if we uh, if we just see a picture from, from far away, we can find that maybe this picture is right. But if we look at it clearly, there are some mistakes. And this is also the is the result on the person's face. There is a, a important concept called the smooth interpolation. This is also introduced before that we keep, we inter, we create the, the, the real data, real picture from the latent Z. And uh, we change the, a few data of the latent Z, then we can smoothly in, change the picture. So if, we, for example, if we have the latent Z for this picture and latent Z for this picture, change this to this, change from this one A to B, little by little, we can see the picture is changed. The picture from the, this, from the latent value is uh, generate uh, uh, And this is the image sample, and it's all the results. And it, it, it can also do the results of what the VAE can do. That is in the smiling man and the neural woman, and the and, uh, smiling woman. Um, yes, okay. yes. That's the neural woman, and the, and the man, he can get a smiling man. It's what the VAE can do also. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, smiling. We share too much neural. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The smiling, the smiling woman. Just the smiling woman to smiling man transformation. And this is also the glass, which is, which you can see is in uh, from the EA. It's also about the latent value exchange. This is from the. Uh, you can see that this man is look for the right, this man is look as the left. And you can find other two per other two person and use their latent value, 21 by one. You can see the middle. The middle picture is uh, look at the middle. This is the result of the uh, represent representation learning. But uh, how uh, yeah, how can you define the accuracy? Mm. Uh, to be honest, I don't under quite understand how he defines his accuracy. Of course, you know it's uh, the unsupervised learning, so he didn't have so every latent he gets. Uh, what is his label? Yeah, yeah, we you can look it up. Oh, okay, fine, thank you. So to be honest, I can I can understand this accuracy. Uh, so let's uh, let's talk about some insurance. 
This is uh, unstable training. This is unstable training because you can see from this one, use one, only 100 uh, dimension, uh, 100 dimension is latent Z. Student uh, transfers this one into the uh, features, which dimension is 64 plus 64 plus three. And you can see there is uh, five, uh, four, uh, five layers and there are so many parameters. So this must be a very, very big training process. So it is very unstable. It is a very unstable training because the model is too big, has too many parameters. Uh, so it is a very brittle architecture choice because, uh, because this is not uh, robust. Uh, for every image they set, he has to change the uh, change this juncture. He has to change this juncture because, for example, the dimension of uh, the dimension, the layers, both of these parameters he needs to change for every set. For example, he do the image they set and the the mini the minutes. He, he has to use totally two different uh, arch architectures. That is, he can use uh, architectures for most of the sets into change. Different uh, sets can use to different uh, code and chips. This is what his uh, problem. It is published uh, in 2015. So there are so many problems we need to deal. The another paper is called Improved Techniques for Training Games. Uh, this paper published, this paper pro, uh, published uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven techniques for training games better. Let's introduce one by one. First, feature mapping. Feature mapping is called the most useful ways to train the games. Uh, maybe you cannot understand all this. I show you the meaning. Uh, when we to train the games, we will maybe we will we will use latent value as input and transfer into a pictures and these pictures. These pictures will with real pictures into the discriminator. Here is the generator. Here is the discriminator. And uh, this is what the generators gener generators uh, output. And uh, this is the real data. When we train games, we will use the result. We will uh, use the result of the discriminator to train both the discriminator and the uh, generator is the min max training. Then what uh, this uh, what is the feature feature matching means is that we uh, we should not use the final results. We can use the uh, use the features in the features in the discriminator training. For example, in the discriminator, we use this as input. Then we use multi layers. For example, if there is three layers. Why not use the layers such as these layers. These layers has come, has come, contains more features than the, the final one. We can use these layers as a, as a feature extractions. The paper called is feature extraction that we use this layer, use this, this layer's results as a, as a feature extractions to train the generators. It will maintain more information. So, uh, and because of these feature mappings, we are feature mapping, we can, uh, we can create more picture, uh, more kinds of pictures. 
historical, the second is called historical average. Historical average, the theta is uh, the current times normal current time. Current times model parameters and the theta spy is the previous. previous times parameters. And what he means that he didn't want the parameters change too quickly. And he wants to look for ref uh, use, the ref use the previous parameters as a reference for his training. This is his update upgrade for parameter theta. Because normally people use the SGD to kind of update all the theta parameters and then train. That's the most popular way to train. Oh, uh, SGD is SGD is also is an adopt miser. He introduced this in competition with that. Like, 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 uh, about the completion, I can't understand. I can't uh, be so confident what he's. Uh, what he realizes, because he will, in this paper he only published his idea, and he uh, he show, he used his idea in some models, but uh, I didn't check it. Sorry, you can go to the source paper and find. Uh, I see the source paper, but I didn't check the source code. Yeah, I mean usually you use stochastic gradient descent. The only difference there is that on, on the slide you use some type of momentum. Say that you want to keep on going in the same direction that you were previously going. So they will apply a set of the data and average of the data smoothly. Yeah, they're just smoothing. So they're, they're saying that you, you don't want to uh, take a sudden change in the fuel spectrum, right? And you can uh, dampen it uh, against the previous weight and just towards the time that there's some type of fuel function. Right. So it should smoothen out your update so that you're you know, gradually turning it. Yeah, it's a, just a to avoid this data to change too quickly. And uh, mini batch discriminator uh, discrimination is another the most useful. Let me introduce it because it's a little it's a little thick. Uh, maybe I can use this page for if uh, for the input. We call it x sub i, which is in the dimension of this is what we call it a. The f x i, the dimension is called f uh, is in a. Then we then then we introduce uh matrix called T. This matrix is T. And uh, let's go another way. X. Fx i is in R a. Then we have some x i. For example, this is one, f x two, and f x three. Then we have a matrix called T. T is in R a b c. And uh, he do the and uh, he use the Fxi to multi the T. Then he can get a matrix if I call this M1, M2, and M3. 
which is in R B multi C. The first he gets the uh, as use the S sub I as the input and uh, he multiplies this transfer transfer matrix T to T is in A multi B multi C and he gets a matrix for example we call it M I M sub I M sub I is in uh, in B multi M sub I's dimension is in B multi uh, B multi C. What he means is that he wants to uh, he wants to different. Uh, he wants to make difference between every every pictures he general generalize uh, because the because uh, the gain uh, the the gains in the what's the gains output is uh, similar. What's the gains output is similar. So what he wants is that to make these images to be more different. So what he uh, so what he did is that he wants to make the difference of this matrix, the M1, M2, and the M3. So how can he make this different? Make this matrix different, and uh, he do uh, he calculate the. He calculates the the difference of this matrix. For example, if we calculate the difference of the matrix one and the matrix two, for every row in the matrix, for example, is M one, M two, and there is a row called there is a row called B. He do the L one regularization between the M1 and M2 for the row B, which is CB. If we introduce X1, X2, which is the EL1. For the matrix one and matrix B. In the matrix one and matrix two in row B. That is uh, to do the absolution of the uh, one uh, to, to do the this row to plus up uh, to decrease no sub, sub yeah this row to sub this row and we get uh, the row the result row and we do the absolution of the results absolution of the results which is the L1 L1 regularizations, and uh, we use this result as the difference of this uh, the difference of two matrix, which is the, the result we can call call it the sigma, which is the O X I B. So C B is in our. CB, CB is the difference of every row. For example, in, in the matrix one, matrix B, uh, matrix one, and matrix two, for one is for row B, for row number B, we can get the result of this of the sub C, the sub. And then we do the other solution, uh, solution, uh, sorry, solution, the solution of this row, then we can get the O X I B, which is in or one, I say in R. <clears throat> so we uh, so we add this. Uh, so we add this O X. We get the final result of X, which is in RB. This are uh, this is this or the final result of X shows the difference 
of the uh, FX1 and FX2. Yeah, and the uh, FX3, the, 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 the average is two. Average is two has the result in the OX. So by this way, we can make the pictures in generators by FX1, FX2, and FX3 to make these pictures to, to be more different. On the slide. Okay. Perhaps I could go through some of the other things that are on the slide and how at the same time. I think several of us are having a bad heart on this. So, um, can you guys give me the intuition for why mini batch discrimination is helpful? I think the blog post that the The main point he wants to do is that to make the FX1 sub i to be more different from the each one. To, for, to, for example, to, for, for the FX sub i sub 1, FX sub 2, FX sub 3, to make these three nation values be more different than from these, these three different values, we can, we can generate our three totally different pictures. Because we, if we use only use scans, we own, we can generate the pictures which are more similar. And we want to make it different. Then how how to make it different? We we need to make this the latent value to be more different. And how can we make the value different? We uh, mount this one to uh, transform matrix, and we get a matrix for each each latent value. And we want to make this each each matrix to be more different. And we calculate the row between the row between each uh, two matrix, and we want to make this uh, this this value to be uh, uh, this value will be uh, on the auxiliary auxiliary information for the models to to train different uh, pictures. So this results OXI will be this results OXI OX will be the auxiliary information just to connect to the information we generate generated before. Just to connect this to the information, then we we generate the date. We will get more different. This is what the mean batch discriminations do. So this, this essentially, because it essentially forces it to up different different images because you're telling the discriminator that if all the images are very close, this is obviously fake. So that it forces it to tell, oh, you're being called the same image, this is wrong. That, that would actually be better in the generator, which will not only generate one, but many. Right. Yes. So I guess it's really important that your mini batch sample is quite diverse. Seven different types of images, and your mini batch sample better not have all examples of one class in one batch because right. they'll all be close to each other. Right. So then we should form the so we should form the matrix and all of these things be like the same thing. Yeah, so it's a it's a diversity within the mini batch, right? Because originally you you were enforcing diversity by just again criteria for for conversion, right? For the loss function, right? So um, I mean that's fine, but then uh, here they're saying you know you can still use the gan log function, but uh, we want your mini batch to conform to some type of diversity tree, right? So the, the gan must generate different types of images uh, that are then fed to the discriminator. The discriminator is making a judgment not on the single image, but on the whole batch of images. Later is uh, called the one side side labels uh, in the in the past we use the label one and the label uh, well, label one 
and zero. What he wants to use is the 0 0.9 and the 0.1. To instead of the label one and zero, if you ask me why, I can I can explain. Because what he's what he introduced in the paper is uh, not uh, because what he explained in the paper, I can I quite understand uh, not understand and I not admit. So I don't want to introduce this one. Mm, because if you if you are interested, you can refer, uh, read the, the the papers. It's only one paragraph. It's uh, it's uh, it, it, his explanation is uh, a little. Uh, and uh, the the cars in the USL, yeah, you use it properly. The UC Berkeley teacher also not uh, admit this idea. <laughs> so, uh, so you can just see that what he what he did is that use the uh, zero point nine and zero point one to instead of the one and zero label. So so uh, this method does not work for this this dimension. Mm, I don't see. I don't know whether it works because I didn't run it, so I cannot say it, it works or not. But uh, the explanation of this of this uh, of this uh, method is not uh, reasonable in both me and uh, the teachers in this program. What he wants to uh, to use? Uh, why he wants to use this? Because uh, you can see here that he used. Uh, It's just alpha. He wants to use the alpha multiply the p data and use the beta to multiply the p model. And uh, the alpha and the beta is is uh, alpha and the beta is uh, uh, what because when we uh, do to use the discriminant uh, discriminator to to divide whether this is the real data or the data that model generalized. And uh, he wants to show that p data is almost zero, and the p model is too large. So the p model will have no incentive. To p data. So he used the beta as zero and the alpha as zero point nine. I don't know why. <laughs> I have seen other explanation about it. Can, can, can you go to the previous slide? Yes, I uh, I've seen other literature which explain why they use one size label instead because uh, uh, typically, uh, in defense, they use the discriminator are uh, too confident. They, uh, for example, uh, for the real data, they just uh, predict one, and for fake data, they predict zero. If the uh, uh, if discriminator comes at a state which is too confident like this, then a uh, generator will hardly learn anything because of the gradient, uh, saturation problem. So, uh, so why they do this is they don't want the discriminator to be too confident uh, about the, uh, the, the, the labels of the images. So they use the 0 0.9 as a ground truth for real data and the 0 0.1 for ground truth of, of the fake data. So this is called something, this is something called uh, smoothing. <laughs> so, so this is very empirically uh, explanation, but uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, Sense. Because what's uh, different is that uh, he just used zero to uh, use the zero to multi this p model, and uh, in the you use the zero, so the gradient I think there will be no gradient about the p model. It's only about the p data. Yeah, I I, I also don't understand what this slide means, but uh, for the previous slide uh, there's some uh, explanation. So what's his uh, what's he what's the paper solution uh, paper explanation is that the p, no, p model 
uh, if we don't use this uh, one side one size smoothie labels with the P model, we'll have no incentive to the P data. But uh, um, the, this, the, the student, um, the, the, he, what he explained is sometimes reasonable, but so if we want to use this, uh, these tools, you need to understand what this means. Because I don't quite admit it. I don't admit it to it. And uh, there is a core, there is a tool called the virtual batch normalization. You can see that. Uh, oh, what is the virtual batch normalization that uh, you can see that uh, this one and this one. This one is, looks, these pictures are most major, and these pictures are most major. What he did is that use virtual batch normalization. Because what, uh, when we do the BN, the batch normalization, we always just for every layers, we just do the batch normalization for, the, for only these layers. And for another layers, we will use uh, totally different uh, parameters. Uh, for example, if, there is, if this is 1,000, and uh, if there is 1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. These two layers must have the quite different visualizations. Uh, oh, 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 also, also there are the dates. Also the dates between these, also the dates after the normalization, there are many years, but the dates, uh, uh, but uh, they have two different standards. So the writer thinks these normalizations is not, uh, is, is uh, not reasonable. So he used the standard, he used the, uh, he, can, he used uh, other layers as a standard. Every layer which wants to do the best normalization, he used he needs to use the standard layers to as the baseline. So this layer, these two layers will get totally different results. What is this, this tool's main point? And uh, however, this, compu uh, this computation, you know, a computa computation is expensive. So don't use this too often. And uh, in the paper, he says, you can only use this in generator, generator network course, this calculations is expensive. This one, uh, semi supervised learning is that before we train against, we use zero for fake, for fake, one for the real data. And uh, he wants to do some, some supervised learning is that for real data, there is, uh, uh, he, there have uh, so many labels in the real data from the one to K, it's there a K source. So the, for the real data, there are K source and uh, he added the K plus one for the fake. Use this use these labels to train the model, and uh, he he said he uses uh, use these labels. He can train the models for more accuracy. And uh, this is the the and the loss for the loss the supervised and the unsupervised is is the same uh, is the is the same as the the gains before only add the p uh, only add the this is the k plus one used is the zero 
k plus y you say d zero and the x y only the y have for uh, only the y before before the before it is only has one label and now it has k or k times label. So the change is uh, so the loss function didn't uh, change quite didn't change. Inception score is what uh, was introduced before, which uh, is inception score is what's introduced here. So I so I don't introduce it again. So oh oh introduce training or uh, introduce math technology for training gains is published on 2016. It's also three years before now. So this paper's result is uh, it's more it can be shown that the, the you can see that the, the image are more different. What is the main point is that we want to make the pictures more different. But the, the quality of the image uh, I can assume but the difference, uh, the difference becomes more. So later, introduce the word turn different distance is for other students. My part is four. Okay, so let's thank our presenter. One left for read test week. Sorry, okay, you want to report me. Okay, so then we're done. So thanks everyone uh, for that. Uh, we'll see you guys next week.